Good morning, church. Hope everybody's doing well. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Scott, uh, senior pastor here at Lakes Community Church, and glad you're here. Welcome. Glad you're joining us. So uh, we finished our series of uh, two, studying through the two books of Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians, an exegetical study. That's pretty much the typical approach that we I, t- I prefer is to kind of go through verse by verse, book by book, through a particular scripture. Um, but fall is in the air, and if you know anything about fall and at least this church, but most churches, kind of new programs are kind of relaunched, or older programs are relaunched in the fall. And we're in that season where we've got a couple of different uh, Sunday morning topics that are going to bleed over into a, a variety of other things that can happen here in the church. So two different topics, they're sort of related and sort of not related, is today we're going to talk about the opportunities that God has equipped and gifted us in, in serving in some capacity in the church. Next Sunday, after service, we're going to have what we're calling a ministry fair, which means we're going to have a whole bunch of tables and booths, weather permitting, of course, outside here. It's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be all kinds of things that are happening, but various people who have volunteered mostly to lead a particular area of ministry are going to be there to tell you about what they do and how what they're doing in that ministry helps to serve and to build the kingdom of God. So today we're going to talk about the importance of understanding our calling, our gifting, and to work and serve in some capacity in the church. Then from that point forward, starting on that, uh, let's see, tomorrow, or next Sunday is the 22nd, then starting on the 29th, we're going to start talking about what has been announced a couple of times already and all the t-shirts in the back. We are going to go through a series of sermons and life group lessons or study guides on uh, this, what you see over here from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, all of these characteristics that God has called believers to follow. It's our responsibility to accept those. And so I'm going to teach on them on Sundays. And for those of you who are in these three or more life groups that have been either going for a long period of time or just now forming back there at the table with Emily, we are going to launch into that and kind of really dive deep into things like what is faith, what is virtue, what is knowledge, self-control, and perseverance, and all of the good stuff that Peter exhorts every believer to follow. So that's kind of what sets us up, really, according to the schedule from now through Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about those topics. So that orients you that we're not going to be going through a book of the Bible to do an, <clears throat> excuse me, an exegetical study of it. We're going to talk about a few topics over the next 10 weeks or so. This morning, as I said, we're going to talk about the importance of serving in the kingdom of God. About maybe four years ago, when Pastor Carl was still senior pastor of this church, he introduced us to a proverb from Proverbs 11:25. Some of you who are here at that time might still have the magnet that hangs on your refrigerator, okay? And it's a really good one. Let me read the verse, and then we'll set this all up. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Now, there's a couple of things I just want to point out to you there. Notice it doesn't say the generous person will be made rich, The generous person will fill their bank accounts. The generous person will have big houses and lots of cars and all kinds of financial means. It says the generous soul will be made rich. What can my soul do with material wealth? Not a thing, right? My soul is completely separate from my physical needs and how I interact with this world. Boy, that soul that God has created for us lives forever, Wouldn't it be great if our soul, while even we're living here on this earth, was made rich? Rich in a richness that lasts not only here, but all the way into eternity, right? The generous soul will be made rich. So we are called, we'll get up on the big screens in a minute, I think. The generous soul will be made rich, and also notice the second part, and he who waters will also be watered himself. So, whether it is finances or whether it is our acts of physical service in the kingdom in a variety of other ways that we can be generous in our soul, we can recognize that God will fill us up because he recognizes our generosity and fills us up to be even more generous and even more blessed by the things that he has equipped and appointed us to do. And he builds his kingdom through our faithful service to him. 
in whatever. In every, I look around the room, there's you know, 150 people or whatever in the room today, and every single one of us may have a different opportunity and a different calling to serve. Some of them overlap, some of them are distinct, but all of us will be given a gift to serve, and if we don't serve, therefore we're not demonstrating generosity in the things that God has gifted us with, then we ourselves will not be filled or rewatered so that we can continue to grow. It's a, it's a beautiful proverb that Solomon gave us, and I want to expand on that in terms of talking about really it's the non-negotiable command that God has given every person who makes a profession of faith in Christ to recognize that we're called to serve, to pick up a torch, to pick up a mantle or a baton of service in some way, and to, in fact, serve the kingdom of God. And I want to recognize, this is a timeless truth that we can all glom on to, and that's to recognize work is not a sin, and work is not a result of sin. Work and the appointment by God for people to do work, his created beings made in his image to do work, started well before the first sin took place when Eve and Adam took of that forbidden fruit, we call it, and took a bite of it. They were still working. Look at what Genesis has to say in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, 26, we read that then God said, this is, the, this is the pinnacle, the highlight, the crowning achievement of all of the six days of creation. Okay? Then God said, let us, the Trinity of God pointed out to us right there, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over every all the, uh, over, sorry, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Then in chapter 2, the next chapter, the expanded man story of creation in chapter 2, then the Lord took, God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. So God gave man dominion. God gave man authority. Now, do we picture God as like bored He's up there and he's in charge of everything, but you know he's in charge, so he's got a bunch of angels and a bunch of other servants, and God's just like so bored, I don't have anything to do. Jesus said, my father is working and I am working even till now. The father is always working. Our father in heaven is always working. Our characteristic, we're made in his image, we're called to work. We're called to serve. We're called to be in relationship to him as he is one, a God who always works and always serves. We're going to see more about how Jesus served even from a position of absolute divinity and authority. He still served people. God is working. God is serving. God's not bored in heaven. God is always active, always working, always listening, always responding, always doing things in heaven. That doesn't mean he's creating again. The six days of creation have already completed. He's not creating, but he is working. And so when God gave man dominion, if we go back to Genesis 1, 26, when God gave man dominion, that's a statement about activity. Go and rule over all of the things that I have made and put your authority over them. Now, you know, it says, I, I like the bottom part, creeping things. Anybody feel like they have an abundance of authority over creeping things on the earth? Well, before the fall, I think maybe we did. But the fall has changed everything. But, you know, can you imagine trying to keep all of God's created things, plants, animals, all the people that would come from Adam and Eve, having dominion over that? That's a lot of work. It's a lot of responsibility. Adam and Eve prior to sin entering the world, prior to the fall that we always talk about, were appointed to and given the task of working and serving in his kingdom, in his creation. So work is not a, a result of the sin. We go, oh, I hate to set an alarm clock and wake up and go to work and plod through eight hours of a day to get a paycheck or whatever else work looks like for you in your life. The drudgery, the Thorns and thistles that maybe this world throws at us to make it difficult to work, that's part of sin. But just the mere task of engaging in labor and engaging in service 
is, in fact, a biblical principle, part of the reason why we ourselves were made. We were not made to lay in a hammock and eat grapes and watch TV. We were made to serve. We were made to work. I just want to reinforce and put a foundation of those things under us. And so God planted a garden, and he told Adam, I planted a garden, and I want you to tend and keep it. Now, again, this garden didn't have thorns and thistles and weeds and all kinds of nasty things, but he still needed to work to tend the garden. There still was work to be done so that the garden would bear fruit and be lush and beautiful, and God had given man the ability and the wisdom and the skill and the requirement to engage in work. And I won't even go to chapter 3, but chapter 3 shows us why it's so much more difficult in all of our lives, because the fall did, in fact, enter the world. Now, in the New Testament, we recognize through a verse that comes up in so many different occasions, it's just always around, is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. But in Ephesians, we see that God appoints believers who believe in Jesus Christ to good works. Many of you can probably quote it. That's okay if you can't. But Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. We talk about that in a whole different story, but, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We don't work for salvation. That's point number one in this three verse couplet here. For by grace you've been saved because God is gracious and he has given us the gift of salvation through our faith, right? But we, and therefore, we can't boast. I can't say, well, I worked so hard, God had to reward me with salvation. That's not scripture. That's not the New Testament doctrine of salvation by faith through grace alone. But once we cross the line, once we make a profession of faith, once we come down the aisle and we say whatever we need to say to say, I accept Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He's my Savior. I believe in my heart. I confess with my lips that he is Lord and God. Then... Chapter, eight, or chapter 2, verse 10 applies. It says, for we are his workmanship. God created us. Like he formed us in the womb. Psalm 139, right? And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He formed you and I in the womb. We are his workmanship. And he created us once we become a new creature in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God created us, he formed us, he owns us, he saved us, he redeemed us, and we come to Christ and he says, okay, in addition to other things you have responsibility for, like feeding your family and taking care of your own thorns and thistles and your own gardens and all of that, I have work for all believers in Christ to do to build the kingdom. He prepared it beforehand. God has foreknowledge, he knows what's going to happen in the future, we don't, but he does, And he knows that each person in the body of Christ has been appointed and gifted and equipped to serve that kingdom, his kingdom, in whatever capacity he has equipped us for and gifted us for. And of course, as I said, Jesus is really our perfect example. He has served another. Isn't it just absolutely beyond comprehension? The creator of the universe the one who is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory, to whom every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He came and served at the lowest level imaginable, right? I didn't even include the washing of the feet here this morning, but you can certainly think about him washing his disciples' feet. Listen to his words in Matthew 20, verse 25. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do we want to be great? The pathway to greatness doesn't look like the world. It's not, how do I climb myself to the top of some ladder? How do I put more people underneath me? How do I sit in my ivory tower and let all of the ones under me do the work for me? 
No, in the kingdom of God, it's how can I rise to greatness by becoming humble and being the greatest servant of those that God has called me to serve? Whole different strategy. It's the servant's hood of God through the example of Jesus Christ looks nothing like how the world describes success, how the world describes leadership, how the world describes authority over others. If we want to be great, the first thing we have to do is become humble. And of course, the moment you say I'm a humble person, you have failed the hum- humility test. So you've got to find a way to be humble, but not acknowledging that you're humble. And the greatest way of being humble is to in fact bring a gift of service to the church, the good news is we don't have to figure out how to serve of our own strength. God is the one who equipped us. God is the one who prepared it for us. God is the one who has gifted us by the power of his spirit. Jesus also says in Luke 22, verse 27, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I Jesus Christ, Lord of the universe, am among you as the one who serves. Everybody agrees. If you're sitting at the table and somebody is serving you, you're, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, you feel more blessed by the fact that you don't have to get up in the kitchen and refill your water glass. You don't have to go up and make the food and put it on the plate and all that. You just sit at the table and let somebody else serve you. That's the end of the greater thing that we would all just recognize. What does Jesus do? Jesus goes, even though he has absolute authority to sit at the head of the table, he goes and does all the work. That's what salvation is. He, he went to that cross and did all the work for you and I so that all we have to do is believe in his name by faith to be saved. He did all the work. He also demonstrated incredible humility and acts of service during his earthly ministry and life here on earth. Okay. So we established that we are created for works. Now, let's recognize that serving the kingdom of God, as I've kind of made a reference to already, is different than serving the things of this world. It's all different. The strategy is different. The rewards are different. The understanding of who's in charge of what is different. The world and the kingdom are really almost polar opposites when it comes to how God instructs us to view our service to him. So greatness in the kingdom of God comes from serving through humility, as I said. Jesus also in Matthew 23, 11 says, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That almost looks like an oxymoron. Almost doesn't look like you can possibly resolve. What does that mean? He who is greatest among you must be or shall be your servant. What? That doesn't make any sense. To the human mind, to the way of looking at things through the world, the way we've been trained in school and vocation work that we may do, he who is greatest is served by the most people. In fact, that's how you know, most of the, if you look at the corporate world, Usually your paycheck is, if you're in management, usually your paycheck is derived by the number of direct reports you have. If you have 30 direct reports, your paycheck is, your paycheck is like this. If you have 100 direct reports, it's a bigger. If you have 1,000 direct reports, it's bigger. If you have 10,000 or 70,000, your paycheck is really big. Right? I mean, that's just kind of the way the corporate world works. The more people you have in direct report relationship to you, the greater your responsibility, therefore the greater your service and the greater your income. Jesus tells us, whoever is your, whoever's greatest among you must be your servant. Flip it over. Flip the coin over. Look at how different the kingdom of God is. We are all called to be servants. Even if we're in leadership, we're called clearly to be servant leaders. Again, works done in humility for God's glory is a demonstration of the genuineness of our faith. I think I mentioned a week or two ago, you know, James and Paul, they're not in any kind of disagreement. Paul, we saw in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God so that we don't boast. But James tells us in his epistle, chapter 2, that if you're demonstrating no works... How do anybody make a claim, how can anybody make a claim that you're still saved? 
when we recognize we've been called to works. God, we've been formed and fashioned by God to serve the kingdom. So look at what James says in chapter 2. I'll read a few verses here from chapter 2, verse 14 on. James writes, but What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? That's a rhetorical question. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit them? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Kind of rattle some cages. He says, uh, it, it says this, but someone will say to you, this is a, quoting somebody, a skeptic, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God, you would do well and tremble. Uh, you would do well. Right, I'm sorry, let me read that again. You believe there is one God and you do well, but even the demons will believe and tremble. It's not enough to have belief. It has to have faith in God and that faith produces an attitude of good works. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it, his faith, was accounted to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now again, He's not trying to doctrinally claim that anybody's saved by works. What he's making this case against is someone claiming to have faith and then saying, but so I have faith, God did all the work, I don't have to do anything. And he's saying, that's not what God saved you for. That's not what God equipped you for. That's not what the Holy Spirit came and dwelt us and gifted us to serve the kingdom for. If you're not demonstrating faith, it's the same as somebody coming through our door and saying, I'm destitute of food, I'm freezing cold, and I have no, nothing to drink, and we go, ah, oh, God will provide for you, have a nice day. It doesn't work. Now, God can provide for them, but don't we have a responsibility to do something for that person in need beyond just speaking words to them? And as a believer, we have more to do in the kingdom than just saying, I believe, I have faith, we actually have a responsibility and a calling and an appointment to serve as God has equipped us. Now, the rewards for service that God grants to us are heavenly rewards. Sometimes you can say, hey, you know, I got a, you know, I've got a good life here. Things, I feel very blessed on this earth. I've got, got, you know, all the, I can pay my bills. I've got a place to live. I can drive a car to and from places I need to go. And, you know, I never seem to miss a meal, whatever it may be. But we can say we have that blessing. But really what we're doing when we're talking about serving the kingdom, it has nothing to do with putting things on the table or in the house here on this earth. It has to do with heavenly-based rewards. And I can't tell you what they are. I can't tell you what we're going to do with them. I can only tell you that those rewards are granted and we're supposed to really, as believers, desire them greatly. Desire to store up treasures for ourselves in heaven where moth doesn't destroy and worm doesn't you know, eat and all the stuff that we see in scripture. Okay. We are looking for precious rewards. Love chapter three of 1 Corinthians. For we are God's fellow workers. Oh, you are God's field. You are God's building, according to the grace of God which was given to me. As a wise master builder, Paul says, I laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed according to how he builds on it. For no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, capital D, day in the future, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work as of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, you know, that wood, hay, straw stuff, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Paul is encouraging the Corinthian believers here, store up treasures in heaven, work for heavenly treasures, build on the secure, firm foundation of Jesus Christ, build his kingdom. Everything that we do that God divinely classifies as wood, straw, hay, whatever, is going to get consumed in fire, nothing left in our heavenly reward, nothing left in our heavenly treasure chest. But God, in his love and mercy and grace, wants every believer to have a massive, overflowing pile of treasures in heaven. But I don't know what we do with them, but I think I want some. I really do. Because Paul and the Holy Spirit tell me I should want some. Okay, so that sets the stage. We don't get our rewards here in heaven. We get our rewards, or we don't get our rewards here on earth. We get them in heaven. Okay, so it's the, this, this world and its reward system is totally different than God and his reward system. Now we see, and we've already looked at it a couple of times, but we see that we are called to use our spiritual gifts to the absolute fullest as God has given to us. Romans 12 is one of the three main spiritual gift passages in scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and Ephesians 4. But Romans 12, I like this, how it talks about the use of the spiritual gifts here. When Paul writes, he says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, that's humility, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith, or a measure of things to do in serving the kingdom. For as we have many members, that would be all of you in the church and me, for as we have many members in one body, all the members do not have the same function. Not everybody stands and preaches on a Sunday morning. Not everybody makes coffee. Not everybody serves in the kids' wing. Not everybody serves in all kinds of incredibly blessed roles and responsibilities that God has equipped us in the church. We don't all have the same function. So we, the church, the body, being many members, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that has been given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, then let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching... He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Notice that each one of these things is first a gift, God equips us, and then he says, go use it for the fullest. Get the gift, use it to the fullest. If you've been given the gift of prophecy, then you better be prophesying every occasion that God has given you to speak prophetically. If he's given you the gift of teaching, then you better be a good, grounded in the truth of God's word teacher, and you better use the opportunities to teach and equip the saints. If you've been given the gift of generosity, then boy, just start pouring out and let God worry about the bank account. You you give give generously wherever God has equipped. That's what it says. If we've been given these gifts, we need to give with full liberality in all that he has done. So... If we have it, we, and we do, we are not just to use it, but really to use it to the fullest potential that God has given us to serve in. Now, the Holy Spirit is the one that we get to recognize is the one who equips every believer according to his own resources. Multiple places in Scripture says he gives gifts according to his own will. None of us get to say, Oh, I'd rather preach than, you know, uh, do maintenance around the, the church facility. If we've been equipped to, to be in church maintenance, if we've been equipped to serve in kids' ministry, if we've been equipped to do live stream or other kinds of technology things, then do it to the fullest of what God has given you. 
And we're not supposed to look at the a head or a mouth or an ear or, or a foot or a hand and go, I sure wish I had that gift. We're supposed to say, no, God gave that person that gift and he gave me this gift and together we form a complete whole organism which can serve the kingdom of God. If we have four hands and no feet, we're nowhere near as good as the way God built us. If we have 10 eyes and no ears, we're nowhere near as good as how God built us. God built us to have two eyes, one mouth, you know, hand, two hands, two feet. For the most part, that's how we are equipped and that's how we are serving in function of our own faculties that we walked in here with. And the whole body of Christ, any local community of believers, just like here at Lakes Community Church, were equipped so that every person has a place Every service area has been filled and gifted by God for that area of service. So he gives gifts according to his own will, and we are therefore instructed to use them as he has gifted us. And the gifts we are exhorted over and over again. We are exhorted to do the gift that he has given us with love for God first and for the people we serve after that. Okay. It's got to be done with love. We've talked about this so many times, but it's got to be done with love. Any one of those gifts I just mentioned, whether it's prophecy or it's generosity or it's teaching or it's preaching or it's serving and maintenance around the church, if we do it but we have not love, it's all wood, hay, stubble. It's all going to get burned up. But if it's done with love, well, that has an incredible reward. Most of us recognize again from the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Just the first couple of verses here. Paul writes, Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. See the balance here between what we read in Romans 12, using the gifts with all fullness, but in 1 Corinthians 13, it's got to be done with love. Love because I'm serving my king, my creator, and my savior first, and then love because I recognize God loves every person that he's equipped me to serve, and therefore, serving them in love serves God in love, and the rewards are guaranteed. But if I do it out of you know, a, a begrudging attitude, I dislike people, I smack them in the back of the head you know, one way or another, that's not going to be a reward in heaven. So it, it's a balance between recognizing what we're called to do and then doing it with the humility and the love that God is called us to because we're supposed to be his image bearers we're supposed to be christians that means we look like christ we talked about it all through the study through thessalonians sanctification we're called to look like christ how does christ love how does christ serve well that's what we're called to do we're called to love and serve the way christ does and i've already given you some examples of that and you know when, when we talk about this i just want to throw in that we won't do, spend hardly any time on this but we recognize that hebrews 11 is that Hall of Faith chapter where Paul lists, you know, a dozen so or so people who are people of faith. Notice again, just as we already read, every person listed in the Hall of Faith is there, not because of their only of their faith, but because like they were listening to James, their faith produced something that God approved of in the area of works. So Scripture connects faith to action. Our faith should be connected to some form of action, some form of service in the kingdom. So they all believed and they all served. Like Abel made an acceptable sacrifice. Remember all the way back in Genesis chapter 4, Abel made a, sac a sacrifice that was well-pleasing to God where Cain, his brother, didn't. What did Abel do? He believed God. In faith, he made a sacrifice. He didn't just go, well, I know exactly what kind of sacrifice God wants and I'm willing to give it, but God knows so I don't have to. No, he actually went through and offered a sacrifice. Enoch walked with God, walking with God. That's like a daily 
going through and listening to and being obedient to the things God had called him to. Noah built an ark. What good would, we would, none of us would be here if Noah hadn't actually built the ark. If Noah said, yeah, God, I get it. You want it to be, you know, 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 75 cubits. And I get all that, but I don't have to do it. You'll just figure it out. You'll just, you'll, I'll just wa- wake up one day and there'll be an ark in my driveway. God said, build an ark. Make it exactly like this because I'm going to destroy the world. And if, I don't, and if you don't build the ark, then nothing on this planet will be saved when the global deluge happens. Abraham left his inheritance, among the many things Abraham did, he left his inheritance to go where God had been calling him. And he ends up spending 100 years dwelling in tents when he left a perfectly fine house in Haran. Abraham actually obeyed, followed God where God called him to go. He also offered up Isaac, that sacrifice in Genesis chapter 22. He actually took his son with a bundle of wood and climbed the hill there in Jerusalem and bound his son on the altar and he raised the knife to slay his son. And then God said, oh, Abraham, Abraham, don't put a finger on your son. Here's the sacrifice I want you to make as a substitution. He actually went through the whole thing fully convinced and believing that God had called him to sacrifice his son, but Hebrews 11 says he believed that God would raise him from the dead. So God's problem, not mine. It was Abraham's approach. Moses forsook Egypt. Moses was a prince in Egypt, raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he is, he gives it all up, goes out in the wilderness for 40 years, and comes back as the deliverer. Moses actually did what God had called him to do. Joshua circled the walls of Jericho seven times on se- in seven days and seven times on the seventh day. Now, if jo- if Joshua goes to, goes to the Lord and says, look, if you want to destroy Jericho, then destroy Jericho. We'll just sit here and watch the, on the sidelines with eating some popcorn. No, God says, here's what I want you to do. You go to Jericho, you with your priests march around Jericho once on day one, once on day two, once on day three, four, five, six, and then seven times on the seventh day, and then shout, and the walls will come down. You know, you have to ask yourself, what would happen if Joshua got tired on day six or got tired on trip number six on day seven? Would the walls have come down? Not according to what he was commanded to do. Faith produces works, and the hall of faith is filled with people who followed God's commands and were obedient to be people of work. Now, can't not get out of the subject without at least talking about how scripture really mocks and condemns the lazy. Okay, there's no groans, so I think we're okay to move on. <laughs> scripture mocks and condemns the lazy. Proverbs 13:4, the soul of the lazy man desires and has nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich, right? He desires, oh, I want all the good things that God has for me. I, I want my table to be full. I want my storehouses to be full. I want, you know, all the goodness, but I'm too lazy. What does, God, what does scripture say? What does Proverbs say about the lazy? He, he desires, but he has nothing. He's got the right heart, but not the right action. Desires and has nothing. Okay. But the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Oh, so we actually have something to do. Uh, let me just read a few more of these. I'll skip. You, they're in the notes. But the desire of the lazy man kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. Like, you could put food on the table, but you'd rather starve to death than actually go out and do some work. I mean, that's, that's kind of a strong condemnation, isn't it? You could go to work. You could feed yourself, and you're laying in your bed and doing nothing. Okay. Strong words. As a door turns on its hinges, from Proverbs twenty six fourteen, so does the lazy man in his bed. You know, you maybe you look at that one and go, "What is God saying there?" Well, a door kind of turns, you know, and a lazy man kind of wakes up and, and goes, hmm, "Should I get out of bed and work today?" Nah, I'll just lay on the other side. Should I get up and work? No, I'll just lay on the other side. 
Just as a door turns on its hinges, the lazy man doesn't get out of bed and go do what God has equipped and appointed him to do. Okay? There's nothing commendable about these actions that we see listed here. Proverbs 6, 6 through 9. Want to get a little bit more under people's skin? Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard, when you rise from your sleep? Did God just say that the ant is more intelligent and wise than the foolish slug? Yeah, he kind of did, didn't he? The ant, little teeny little ant thing with a brain not as big as, you know, anything I can fit on my pinky. Or so much big, I could fit probably a hundred of them on my pinky, right? We, the ant is doing the wisdom of God. The sluggard, the lazy, the, the one who won't get out of bed and go do something is condemned here because man has a bigger brain. Man has a lot more intelligence. Man recognizes cause and effect far greater than an ant, and yet an ant can go and gather food and store it for when it needs it. And man looks at work and says, eh, something else will happen. My neighbor will give me food. I'll, you know, God will drop food out of heaven, but I'm just too lazy today. I don't want to go to work. Scripture condemns and mocks this behavior of a lazy person who refuses to do the things that God has called them to do as an intelligent person. All right, let's close with this. Practical application. You'll understand this in a second. A penny for your service. The work-life balance for believers must include time to serve God. No one, including me, is saying, quit your jobs and come and volunteer at the church. That would be foolish for you and for us. If you're, you know, if you're retired, you don't have to work, you're independently wealthy, that's fine, you do what you want. But you've, there's got to be a work-life balance. How many of you have heard the term work-life balance somewhere in your existence? Right? Oh, you've got to give work work time and home home time. Well, we've got to have a work-life balance. But in, as a believer, our work-life balance must be a work-life service in the kingdom balance. It's got to be more than just home life and work life, work life and home life. It's got to be work and home. We got to take care of our responsibilities because if a man will not work, neither shall he eat, right? We saw that in Second Thessalonians 3. We've got to make sure that we are a good father and a good mother and a good child in our house, and we got to serve our household. And we got to, you know, if I got, you know, projects galore that aren't getting done at home, I got to get some of those done, pull the weeds, you know, take out the trash, clean the kitchen. I got to do things, otherwise my household falls apart. I got to have the work. I got to have the balance at home. But somewhere in there, every believer has got to say, and I have time to serve the way God has equipped me and called me to serve in my local church for the kingdom of God. Got to be a work-life balance that includes service to the kingdom of God. Believers must be responsible, as I said, for providing for their family, so I won't go back to that in Thessalonians. Believers should also take appropriate time for rest, family, and being relational with others. So it's not all about, I don't, I don't believe that scripture is saying, hey guys, you got 24 hours in a day, and if you're working for eight hours a day, then get to the church and serve the church 16 hours a day. But I believe that there is this balance that we are called and equipped to know and understand. And so we need to take appropriate time. I, rest. Have you recognized how many vacation days God gave the Israelites? You've got a weekly Sabbath, and you've got, of course, the Passover celebration with the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the spring, and you've got Pentecost in the kind of late spring, and you've got the fall feasts, and you've got this whole year of Jubilee, and the seventh year of rest, first of all, and then the year of Jubilee. God gave people, his people, lots of time for rest. So we need to take time for rest. We need to have time for building our relationships, equipping our family for the, the things of the ministry. But somewhere in that mix, I honestly believe God would not say, okay, that person's too busy. I don't have anything for them to do. I believe God has appointed and equipped every believer to some task, something. Well, guess what? Next Sunday, 
after church, there's going to be tables out here with ministry heads and leaders and volunteers who are already serving, and all of them will say, I think we could use some more help. Somewhere in there, somewhere in there, between now and then, I really ask, don't, please don't avoid next Sunday. Come back. <laughs> Come back. Between now and then, pray. God, I believe that your word has taught me that I'm supposed to serve in the kingdom. P- I pray that you'll lead me to a place where I can be most effectively used by you. And let me recognize that if I lack the skill, I know that you will help me and equip me to get the skill through both your your Holy Spirit and through a leader who can guide me into greater levels of proficiency in a certain area. And that you will free up time in my schedule so that I can actually serve in that capacity. I don't know what it is. I'm not here to look at anybody's eyeballs and say, I know what God has called you to. That's between you and God, but I believe if you walk away from this week or next week and say, yeah, I can't find anything for me to do. There's nothing. I think you're not listening to the power of the Spirit. And really, we're called to serve. Okay. So with that in mind, I don't know exactly if, uh, logistically how this is going to work. We've got a staff meeting after church today. We'll talk about it. The thought process it was kind of, uh, poised by Jeremy months and months and months ago was let's give everybody a coin, a penny or whatever at the start of next service and by the end of next service at the end of the ministry fair that penny should be invested in one of those areas of ministry. Go drop it in a jar, in a container, something. Say, I'm willing to drop my investment into the kingdom into this area of ministry. And I've always said, look, if you don't know where you're gifted, if you don't know where God might be calling you to serve, serve in a lot of areas until it becomes more clear. No, and I'm not trying to, you know, be flippant here. Serve in kids ministry if you can, you know, pass the background jazz and all that kind of stuff, but, because we want to protect our kids. But serve in kids ministry. Serve as an usher. Serve as a greeter. Serve making coffee. Serve in tech and media. Serve somewhere and try it for a month. Try it for three months and see if that might be where God has actually equipped and gifted you to serve. If not, then go, well, the world is my oyster. I've got lots of other choices to go see where I've been equipped and gifted to serve. Does this make sense? Okay. I want to be faithful to what God's word says. As a shepherd of the sheep, I want for you far more than I want for myself. I want to see you thrive and grow and be used by God in a way that builds your reward treasures in heaven, I'm not so concerned about our church. This is just a mechanism by which God, we know God will use you to build his kingdom. And I, so I'm, I'm trying to sh- be a shepherd to encourage you to consider how God has appointed and equipped each and every one of us to serve and jump in there and serve. If you're already serving and you're already, you know, double, triple booked on every Sunday, well, it's probably not something you need to drop your coin in another jar for. But if you're, you just haven't signed up anywhere, please consider in joining our church and serving the kingdom. If you're a visitor here, you know, obviously you don't sign up for something that you're not going to continue with us. But if, you're, if you call this place home, please pray this week about how God would call and equip you to serve in some area. And with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have a purpose and a plan for each of our lives, Lord. That plan includes that every single one of us would make a profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's by your blood that our sins have been washed away clean. It's by your sacrifice, Lord God, that we are made whole and complete and acceptable before you. But we recognize, Lord God, the entirety of the New Testament calls us to action calls us to be good stewards of the gifts that you've given us, calls us, Lord God, to engage in kingdom-building work, even if it seems lowly and uninspiring to others. If it's a gift that you've given us, Lord, we know that you will use it to your full glory to build your kingdom. So I pray that each one of us, Lord God, would have a heart of conviction and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit might say to our hearts, This is the way I have chosen for you. Walk in this way and let us, Lord, store up treasures for ourselves in heaven, not because of our 
wonderful good things that we are, but because of the blessings that you have chosen for us to enjoy in eternity with you. And we pray these things, Lord God, by the power of your name and the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Have a wonderful, blessed day. We have prayer teams up front. If you need prayer for anything, see prayer teams or a pastor, elder. And other than that, have a wonderful and blessed Sunday.